each other as we, uh, as we miss our sister. And, and uh, it's not easy to, to say goodbye to someone we love. But uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, life isn't as we wish it to be. We just gotta trust our Lord. But uh, comfort one another as well. And some of the love is passed on. So. Well, following the parable of the sower, we find in Mark chapter 4, we read this passage in verses 10 through 12. I'm going to read for you what Mark reported back in chapter 4. He said, as soon as he, this is Jesus, was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables, so that while seeing, they may see and not perceive, and while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. Now, when I read these passages, just to let you know, when you see in all capital letters, that's something like out of the Old Testament. Okay, that's why there's a difference between, it. well, in the case, sometimes all over and kind of mixed because that block of all capitals means this is pulled out of the Old Testament scriptures. I want to summarize this passage for us real quick, all right? It, it, this means that to the apostles and other disciples of Jesus who had hearts and minds that were open to his teaching, he revealed the meanings of his parables. But to those whose hearts and minds were closed to his teachings, Christ concealed, that is, he hid the meanings of his parables. However, today's passage, we find an exception to this rule. For in the parable that Jesus tells in Mark chapter 12, those whose hearts and minds were closed to the teachings of Jesus understood very well the meaning of his parables. Now, today's account takes place just two days before Christ was crucified. As we looked at last week, the religious leaders have already questioned Jesus about his authority to cleanse the temple. And now he shares with them, as well as his apostles and other disciples and those other peoples who just came to listen in, he shares with them a parable whose meaning spoke of both past events and events that were very soon to take place. If you're following your Bible, we're in Mark chapter 12. We're going to start at that very first verse. But before I begin reading, I want you to know that it's important that we realize that this parable brings to mind Isaiah's Song of the Vineyard, which is found in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Uh, we are going to look at that passage a little later, but right now we're going to focus on what Mark has to say to us. So Mark chapter 12, verse number 1 tells us this. And Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it, and dug a bat under the wine press and built a tower, and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. Okay, as was the case with all the parables of Jesus, here too, he uses familiar imagery found in daily life in order to illustrate a spiritual principle. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, uh, protecting it from thieves. He dug a bat under the wine press, which would collect the juice from the crushed grapes. And he built a tower. Uh, such a tower would serve as a lookout post. It would also offer shelter for the workers, as well as provide storage space for seed and for tools. And realize that this arrangement between the vine growers uh, that we see here and, and the landlord, it's nothing unusual, okay? An absentee landlord renting his land to tenant farmers was common in Galilee. It was a practice that Jesus' audience would have been familiar with. In such situations, an agreed-upon share of the harvest 
would be given to the landlord after the crop was gathered. Okay? Now, with those thoughts in mind, we're going to continue to read verses 2 through 5. And they explain that at harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. They took it and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent them another slave, and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and that one they killed. And so with many others, beating some and killing others. So as expected, at harvest time, uh, the vineyard owner sent one of his slaves to collect the amount of produce that was due to him as written in the contract. But, as we've read, the vine growers do not comply with the terms of the contract. Not only did they send the slave back to the vineyard owner without produce from the land, but they beat him. Just as a side note, that word for beat that we find in the passage here, it's a form of Greek verb that literally means to remove the skin. Okay, so just think about that. So the vineyard owner sends another slave to collect the produce due to him. But this one they wound in the head and for chamberlain. So a third is sent and this one is killed. And Matthew's parallel account, the third slave was stoned. And then Jesus goes on to explain that many other slaves were also sent, some of which were beaten, some of which were killed. But then we get to verse 6. When the vineyard owner makes one last effort to receive the share of the produce that he is due. Mark 12, 6 explains that he had one more to send, a beloved son. He sent him last of all to them, saying, they will respect my son. Will they respect him? Verses 7 and 8. But those vine girls said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. They took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. See, not only do they not respect him, but they kill him. Now that's the end of the parable, okay? But the passage is not yet complete. So what I want to do is I want to look at one more verse that Mark shares with us here right now. Mark chapter 12 and verse number 9. The very next verse tells us this. It says, Jesus still speaking, by the way. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. So, in Mark's gospel, at the parable's conclusion, Jesus asks the religious leaders as well as his followers and the crowd standing by, a question, which he in turn answers for himself. However, here it's interesting to know how Matthew's gospel reads at this point in the parallel account. You see, as in Mark's gospel, Jesus asks a question. But in Matthew's account, Jesus is not the one who answers. Matthew writes this, Jesus speaking here. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Okay, so we've got two accounts here. Now, putting these accounts together, it's been suggested, I want you to think through this. It's been suggested that Jesus here asks the question, the listeners answered it, and then Jesus restated that answer back to them. You know, we do this all the time. Uh, at a restaurant, the waitress asks us what we'd like to drink. We answer her question, she answers it back. Sir, what would you like to drink? Yeah, I'll take a Pepsi. You want a Pepsi? Here, in this account, Jesus asks, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, 
What will he do to those vine growers? They responded, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will run out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay the proceeds of the proper season. He stated back their answer to them. He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard. Now, before we finish the account, I, I want to explain the meaning of the parable. And to do that, I want to read that, I, that song of the vineyard that Isaiah records for us. I referred to it earlier. And when I do it, you're going to notice the parallels between what is in Isaiah chapter 5 and the parable that we've just read here. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 5, starting at verse 1, here's what we read. It says, let me sing now for my beloved, my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it, and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste, and it will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain, no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. Now, let me explain a little bit about this passage, okay? In it, the vineyard represents Israel, which is what we see right here in verse number 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the ones who planted and owned the vineyard, it's God. God owns that vineyard, which is Israel. And Isaiah the prophet here explains that God will judge Israel because it did not produce good spiritual fruit. Among the sins of Israel was idolatry, the worship of other gods. Therefore, we find this, verse 5 tells us what the result of their sin would be. He said this, So now, let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard, Israel, I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. You see, God would take away that, that hedge of protection and allow it to be consumed and trampled. And as history records, that's exactly what the Assyrians did. Now, Jesus takes the meaning of Isaiah's song of the vineyard, and he modifies it. In today's parable, the vine growers represent the religious leaders of Israel, who are responsible for the spiritual growth of the vineyard. And again, that vineyard is God's people, Israel, the Israelites. However, the religious leadership refused to give God the vineyard owner, his share of the produce. And what's the produce that God should have received? He should have received more people coming in relationship with him. A relationship based on his, their love for him. Not a relationship or a so-called relationship based on man-made rules. Follow the list of Jews and don'ts. We talked about this guys earlier in the book of Mark, where the, the, the religious leaders have put together those traditions of the elders, those man-made rules, those extra rules outside of the Bible that they expect the people to follow. 
God didn't want a relationship based on that. You see, instead of doing what they should have done, the religious leadership of Israel led God's people away from him. And they even beat and killed some of the prophets that God had sent to them to them to lead them back to him. And in parable, those prophets were the slaves that the vineyard owners sent to the vine growers. And of course, at the very end, we realize that the son of that vineyard owner that was sent represents Jesus, God's son. Now, it's interesting to note that in regards to the son, you remember this, we read that verse 6 starts this way, he had one more to send a beloved son. Do the words beloved son sound familiar? You, you might have heard it before. Uh, we remember the words of God at Jesus' baptism. God said these words to Jesus. You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Also, at the transfiguration of Jesus that we learned about back in Mark chapter 9, while Peter and James and John were on the mountaintop, uh, with, with, with Jesus, okay? God said these words to those three apostles about Jesus. He said, hey guys, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now, also, within the parable, we see a, a prophetic reference displayed in the actions of the vine growers. Again, Mark 12 8, explains to us that they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. And yeah, Jesus would be killed. Right? Those behind the plant were the religious leaders. But we also know the words this, threw him out of the vineyard. Now this, these are significant, I'll tell you why, okay? In just two days, Jesus would be killed, crucified, outside of the walls of Jerusalem. Therefore, he would be killed outside of the ultimate vineyard of the Lord, outside of Israel. Now, I want to reread for you the two verses, excuse me, out of Jerusalem, I said that one. Now, I want to reread re -re for you those two verses from Matthew's account that we looked at a moment ago. Matthew 21, 40 and 41 said this, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? Well, they said he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and run out the vineyards of other vine growers who will pay them the proceeds at the proper seasons. Now, this here, it's ironic. These, the apostles, the other disciples in the crowd, they answer the question here, okay? But so did the religious leaders. Or at least if they didn't answer, they knew what the answer was. They, the religious leaders themselves, recognized the wicked, sinful behavior of the vineyard growers. But by doing so, they were condemning themselves. They were the wretches in this parable. And they themselves here admitted, or if they didn't answer the question aloud, they at least knew that the vineyard owner, God, would rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will give him the fruit of his vineyard. That is, who would oversee and lead his people. They had done such a poor job. I mentioned at the beginning that those whose hearts and minds were closed to his teaching, Christ concealed, that is, he hid the meanings of his parables. But in today's passage, we find an exception to this rule. You see, the, the religious leaders, those whose hearts and minds were closed to the teaching of Jesus, they understood very well the meaning of this parable. They realized that in Jesus' parable, they were the vine growers. They realized that Jesus had spoken this parable against them, and they were angry. So Mark's account continues in verse number 10, just saying this. Jesus asks the guys a question. Hey, have you not even read this scripture? I'm going to stop for just for a second. And again, irony here. Because part of those religious leaders are the scribes. They're the, they're the religious leaders that are the experts in the Old Testament law. 
the Old Testament scriptures. They knew what the scriptures said. They read them all the time. But here Jesus says, hey guys, haven't you read this passage? And here it is. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, this passage is actually a quote from Psalm 118, and we quoted from Psalm 119 a few weeks ago. You see, it was from Psalm 118 that this verse comes. See if you recognize these words. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowd was shouting that verse from Psalm 119 when Jesus came riding that colt into Jerusalem on the day of the triumphal entry. And that had only been the age before. But here's the point. The religious leaders did not accept Jesus as what? As that chief cornerstone. Instead, Jesus is being rejected by the builders, that is, by the religious leaders. You see, and those of you who work uh, construction, those type of people, you'll understand this a whole lot better than I do. The chief cornerstone is the most important part of the stone building. It, it, it sets the foundation and the correct angles for all the aspects of the building's construction. And Jesus is the chief cornerstone in God's church. The entire structure of the church depends on him. And salvation available to all mankind rests on him and his work on the cross. The Apostle Peter, the book of Acts, sometime later, he said these words directly to the religious leaders. Peter said this. He, being Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And today's passage, Mark 12, it ends this way. The last verse says this. The religious leaders here. They were seeking to seize him, Jesus, and yet they feared the people. For they understood that he spoke the parables against them. And so they left him and went away. If you were with us last week, we find here that the religious leaders are facing the same dilemma that they did in last week's passage. Remember these words from last week? Jesus asked the religious leaders a question. Here's the question Jesus asked. He says, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. So the religious leaders began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Then why do you not believe him? But shall we say from men? They were afraid of the people. For everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. Answer Jesus said, we, we don't know. You see, the religious leaders knew that Jesus spoke the parable of Parallel, parallel against them. But again, just like in last week's account, they feared the people. If they sought to seize Jesus, the crowd may have risen up in revolt. And we've said this before, as Scripture tells us, all the people were hanging on to every word he said. Now, as we reflect on this passage, it's very important that we keep in mind the end words of verse number 9 in Mark's account. Okay, once again, verse 9, this is what it says. Jesus is speaking. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. So who are the others? You see, the religious leaders fail to lead God's people in God's ways. So God placed other leaders with his people. Jesus was the greatest leader of all. He, his life was lived in complete obedience to his heavenly father. And he was the good shepherd. The perfect leader of God's flock. Following Christ's ascension back to the father, the apostles led the early church. 
We read of some of their work in the book of Acts, and we have letters written by the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John, and the Apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus. All of these letters help to lead God's church in the ways of the Lord. And the apostles courageously and boldly led the early church, regardless of fierce opposition from those who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And while every person that I've mentioned so far okay, has been Jewish, many, many Gentile leaders have also faithfully led God's people throughout the centuries since the days of the apostles, including the leaders of the church of 2020, and specifically the leaders of Fairburn Christian Church. Now, this congregation has been led by godly leaders since it began on the grounds of Michigan Christian Service Camp on March, excuse me, on November the 17th, 1974. And right now, we're in the midst of recommending leaders, godly leaders, to lead this congregation forward in its mission of proclaiming the gospel to all who have yet to hear the message of salvation that's available only through Jesus Christ. Now, some of you have already turned in your recommendations for the 2021 officers of Carroll Christian Church. Others who haven't yet, but you will. In this morning, our song of invitation is actually going to be a song of commitment. It's, it's one that we sang already this morning, Living for Jesus. But I want to explain that part of living for Jesus includes praying for the leaders of his church. That they will faithfully, obediently, lovingly serve him through, his, through their service to his church. And so my question today, and while we sing this song of commitment, is will you commit yourselves to praying our leaders. Serving in God's church is a huge honor, but it's also a huge responsibility, and sometimes it is hard work. And, and please be in prayer for those officers who will be serving this congregation in 2021. Our leaders need your prayer support. Pray with me, please. Our Father, we come to you this morning and we see in your word today a parable that Jesus told really just spot on at those religious leaders. Father, he put them in a place that they had failed in their job to lead his people, to lead your people closer to you, lead your people in the ways of Scripture. Father, they had a big responsibility and they, they didn't take the responsibility seriously enough. They didn't, they didn't do it. They didn't do what they were called to do. And Father, you have always called leaders to lead your people to follow you. And Father, you've done that through the, through the, through the centuries, and you continue to do that today. And Father, we're in the midst of a time where we're recommending leaders for, for next year for Fairland Christian Church. And Father, as we do that, I just pray as a congregation that there would just be prayers lifted up to you of support, of encouragement, Pray for the wisdom and, and the strength and, and greater knowledge for our leaders that they would lead this church in ways that are in accordance with Scripture and pleasing in every way to you. And so, Father, as, as a group, as a body right now, we just commit ourselves to praying for these people. And we, we live for you, and part of what we live for you is praying for those that you put over us to lead us. Thank you for this time we have studied your words. In the name of Jesus, we pray.
what, what a tremendous job. Sharon's not here today, and this guy's set up like perfect. I mean, Elijah, you taking notes here, buddy? You got to pick up the <laughs> courage card. Right. You can well do so. In the back, before we leave, there are sign sheets. If you'd like to help to fill those Thanksgiving black baskets, please stop by and do that, right? Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for the chance to be in your house. Thank you for the chance to, to fellowship and encourage, to sing songs, uh, to encourage one another in songs to praise you. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. Amen.